Setting up that committee is Paul Robinson. Now, Paul, what actually happens in here and when do you do it? We do it on Friday mornings. We have a good time. All the producers and lots of the DJs and myself sit around a table and we play records and we play them and we discuss them. Yeah, that sounds all right and that's great. That's a bit naff. And we think where they may fit into the network sound. We then look at the existing playlist, which is a list of records, basically, records that are played on daytime Radio 1 and decide what's tired, what's had enough uh, and what we're going to replace them with. How many records do you listen to in the course of this meeting? It depends. In uh, certain times of the year, it gets a bit thin and less records released, but normally about 40 or 50 records. Uh, that's about the maximum you can listen to without getting totally shell-shocked and not really being able to tell you know, what's good from bad. Uh, but it does vary a bit. How do you know what people want to hear? Well, we have the DJs and all the producers and myself and everyone else who writes to us. We meet them, of course, outside. You have continual feedback. There's a BBC research department to help a bit as well. It's a dialogue. It's a bit of gut feel, a bit of research. I mean, you're paid to know, really, aren't you? You're paid to know as well. All right. I suppose Radio 1 is still the major player, the major hit maker of all the radio stations in the UK, probably in Europe. Um, give us an example of how Radio 1 has made, say, a recent record a hit. Yeah, the thing about the Radio 1 playlist is we do pick up stuff early before anybody else. And it's great when you pick up a record by someone you've never heard before, maybe their debut single, and you play it and it becomes a hit. And there are lots of examples. A great one currently is Tasmin Archer. Young girl, know nothing about her. We play the record it's a great record went on the playlist and now it's a hit and when that happens it's a great feeling thank you for allowing us in here by the way i'm not allowed to come to the next playlist meeting until a month's time so i look forward to seeing you then and here's that record on our tour of radio one we're even further into the damp we have come below i think the tube is now above us uh, we're with phil lawton and we're in the vaults of the radio one archives Phil, it's nice to see you. I haven't seen you for about six months. How are you doing and what the hell is down here? Down here we've got, um, it's split into two parts. We've got music tapes and speech tapes. Uh, music tapes consist of sessions and we've got over two and a half thousand different groups down here. Um, all doing various sessions. Uh, lots of concerts inside and outside venues such as last year had the Summer in Excess concert. This year is right. the uh, Norwich Sound City. So lots of festivals, Donington, Reading things like that, and also live performances from various uh, programmes such as Mark Goodyear has live people in, or the old Saturday sequence, uh, Johnny Walker programmes. Presumably all of this is part of our rock music heritage and must be looked after. Uh, how many hours a day do you work down here? Um, I'm down here eight hours a day. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, there's just so much material coming in all the time. I mean, for example, I had a, a producer recently uh, clearing out his office and he brought me down two great big bin loads of tapes. Um, it had stuff from 1972 from the Lincoln Festival, which I happened to be there. And there were interviews with Slade, Beach Boys, Lindisfarne. Uh, absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's just a real treasure trove. You think it's important to keep all of this stuff? Oh, it's essential. Well, before Tommy Vance talks us through a Radio 1 archives montage, in your view, what's the rarest item in sound that you have here? What, what is your most treasured piece of archive? Uh, well, my most treasured personally is the John Lennon interview from 1980 with Andy Peebles. Andy Peebles, yeah. I mean, that is just absolutely brilliant. Every time you listen to it, especially if you like the Beatles or John Lennon, it sort of brings a tear to the eye, especially with him talking about New York being a safe place. You know, hours later, he was dead. So that's extremely valuable, I think. I can go right out this door now and go in a restaurant. Do you want to know how great that is? Mm. Or go to the movies? I mean, people will come up and ask for autograph or say hi, but they won't bug you, you know? Lay down John Lennon from Pop Go the Beatles, 1963. Here's Jimi Hendrix from Top Gear, 1967. Right, so welcome back to the David Hamilton Show from Mallory Park this afternoon. Uh, you've probably gathered that we have a slight amount of chaos partly going on behind us since the Bay City Rollers have been here. We have uh, a little river surrounding, uh, well, two various parts of the track here, and the girls are actually swimming across the river to try and get their idols. In the meantime, their idols are trying to get away. They are, in actual fact, on a little boat now in the middle of the lake. I don't know where they're going to go from there, but that's where they are at the moment. And I remember when I was writing Bohemian Rhapsody, I had a song called We're the Champions, but I just didn't feel that it, it fitted at the time and and I just kept it aside and uh, it was I think about two or three years later that I sort of pulled it out of the bag again and there you are so you you can never tell 
five to one, and a blonde woman in a pink baseball cap emerges from the Hyde Park Hotel in London with a group of minders in matching green shirts. It's Madonna, and the chase is on. The Madonna Phenomenon, 1990. Now about 100 people in pursuit. Photographers, fans with cameras, reporters, some of them on bikes. OK. Get too close. One of the miners pushing me out of the way. Come on, if you can't run, get out of the way. Come on. Exclusive, live and direct, and only on Radio 1 FM, from Wembley Stadium, the Blonde Ambition Tour, Madonna. The F Word Concert. 1990. I did it a couple of times the night before, and someone mentioned that that's all I do was say f So I said, okay. They think I, they think I said f all during the show. I'm going to show them what saying f during the show is. <laughs> the thing so. that was marvelous about it for me, and mm -hmm. okay, I'm way over, I'm older than you, was it devalued the word. And it's about some time someone did devalue the word. Absolutely, it's, a, it's much overrated, and I, I you know. That's the problem with a lot of things. I mean, if, if people weren't so reactionary, you know what I mean? So all the things I did do wouldn't be so shocking. Steve Wright, talking to Ruby Wax earlier this year. What kind of teenager were you? Uh, depressed and hideous. One. I was had teeth that were in another time zone. <laughs> they were not... I was called tusks. Oh, uh, true. Oh, oh, oh. 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 No, I was not an attractive child. I was one of those late bloomers. Really? Yeah. Well, you know how girls, like in puberty, when they're gorgeous, they, they're they gone. In a second, they fade very quickly. And I sat like Madame Defarge with my knitting needles, waiting for the downfall of every beauty during puberty. <laughs> and sure enough, they've either gone into the Betty Ford Clinic or killed themselves. And I'm the only survivor. Steve Wright, interviewing the Prime Minister at number 10. BBC Radio 1 FM, you're listening to Steve Wright in the afternoon, and you catch us this afternoon here in the study of number 10 Downing Street with the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to Radio 1. We're very grateful. Uh, this is huge in here. Number 10 is It's like the TARDIS. <laughs> it's very big. It's, uh, it looks fairly small from the outside, doesn't it? You see this uh, familiar door and what looks like a rather narrow terraced yeah. house. But it is huge. It's on a series of floors. And I guess people don't generally realise that it stretches straight through into number 11 and number 12 and also straight through the other way to Whitehall. It is very large indeed. You can go right in and have a chat with the Chancellor. Absolutely. Cup of tea. Whatever. <laughs> well, he's a good friend. It's been known. <laughs> can I please hear a round of applause for Simon Bates and Jonathan Ruffell? As they leave for the round the world trip, they get a gigantic round of applause. Right now, Bates and Ruffle are off to Barry Island, Wales, to board a ship off to Antigua and around the world. It's noon. Band-Aid, Christmas 1984. Bob Geldof is here. Bob talking, uh, initially at least, not as a member of the Boomtown Rats as such, but as the instigator of a, a fascinating idea to raise money for the Ethiopian famine appeal. Mm. Perhaps you'd like to vaguely describe what you're up to. Um, well, what we're up to is uh, getting as many people from British pop music as possible to sing on a song that Midgeur from Ultravox and myself have written called Did They Know It's Christmas? And uh, I went around, phoned up everybody I knew, much to my surprise. They all wanted to do it, so... It sounds like a nightmare putting it together, Bob. It was, but, I mean, great fun. I mean, I just thought, thought of it ten days ago, I think, and uh, I have a low boredom threshold. If it had gone on any longer, I would have started getting bored, but if I have a bee in my bonnet about something, I get cracking, usually. And now, to start the 16 hours of Live Aid, would you welcome Status Quo? 